Call me order at 6.38ish. Um, public comment? Let's see any members of the public. Stars tonight. Uh, so, consent agenda. Um, motion. Sorry, sorry. I motion. I want to pull new teacher contracts because I didn't see any materials. Business extended board meetings and retreat planning. So I sent around finalized dates, um, which, if memory serves, are May 1 and June 5th, with the retreat on June 19th. And I talked to the VSBA, and Susan can come on June 5th to do so some communication. She said she was going to get in contact with you as okay, well to perfect. hear your thoughts on what it should be. Okay. Um, and so June 5th, she's good to go. And then you and I can think Talk about, about May first. Yeah, May first. I just got some really good stuff today. So okay, perfect. And then we'll also put together a draft retreat schedule and send that around well in advance, so we can all be on the same page about what's on that. So, any other questions on that? Otherwise, we'll turn twenty minutes into twenty seconds and <laughs> <laughs> just keep risk going. having Michelle show up at an empty school at yeah. seven forty. <laughs> Just ask super quick. What was the theme for May first? June fifth was going to be communication. What were we thinking for May first? Diversity, equity. equity. Yeah. Okay. So can, can I? Just are you hiring them? someone to come on May first to do that? We don't have time. That's what I was just going to say. You don't have time. <laughs> it's like right around the corner. Yeah. Right around the corner. Well, uh, besides that, I'm not sure there's enough time there. That anybody that would do training on equity would say you haven't got enough time. Right. Yes. I think it would, we have enough materials that we could do a nice opening salvo to the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Can I, I ask? We get someone internally in too who's just had a lot of experience. We could. Yeah. yeah. Like. Mm -hmm. For future reference, Kathy Johnson is in town and she did do the high school training. So. Yes. What is the time frame for having the health? curriculum and substance abuse discussion? Um, so we have to plan that either fold into the retreat or make it like a major agenda item on a meeting like tonight when we don't have much else. Yep. I'm just putting in a vote for it being urgent. Yes. No, <clears> it's <throat> it's definitely one of the things we want to. Um, so maybe, <laughs> maybe May 15th. Yeah. I would um, love Mike McCray there too. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe May 15th. <coughs> the reason we didn't extend it is because Libby and I have a VSBA thing. Yeah. Um, but if we don't have anything urgent, I was thinking maybe we could take May 15th and do it um, or make it an item on the board retreat. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions about the board meetings or retreat? Did we have times for the retreat? I block out all day for the 19th. Um, okay. And we can, I mean, we have a meeting technically scheduled that yeah. night, so we could either do, we could either like a noon start and go and do it like after lunch and maybe like have, you know, pizza or something for dinner. Um, or, uh, why don't you decide what your agenda is, decide how much time you need, and then yeah. send out the plan. Exactly. Well, I mean, I, I don't think we want to do more than like a seven or eight hour block, regardless. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so it's just do we do like an afternoon evening thing, or do we do like an all day thing and stop at, you know, 4.30 or 5. Yeah. So we did have public comment, but since we have a light agenda and you're here, I'll open it up again quickly if you came here to say something. Yeah, no particular comment, just your answer. Okay, Thank good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
So I think outside board meetings and retreat planning, let me now get more specific um, stuff together and circulate it uh, after we meet next, which <coughs> will be after vacation. I think after vacation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll be in Florida next Wednesday. <laughs> fast. It'll be May first meeting. Uh, maybe we can email some ideas before Friday, just so we aren't cold. Um, So, learning focus and hope and um, MR here, a good suggestion on getting a Roxbury person um, who can certainly, who either could come to all meetings or maybe could just be the Roxbury representative at Roxbury meeting. <coughs> um, to be clear, Hope emailed that she's coaching a soccer team and this is her last time yeah. that interferes with a board meeting yeah. for the rest of the school year. So, yeah. and then I just said she couldn't have. And before I I have to fake that I read this. I'm going to admit that I did not. <laughs> super quick. Yes. Super quick board meeting. <laughs> um, but I know others did. I just, um, yeah, uh, I just know. I, I was going to read it on the plane, and something came up, but I had to. Had to it's like, dude, it's like so I know, but my plane time got, <laughs> so like that got that appropriated. Not, kid, huh? right. <laughs> the kids already teach me. There is no real. Um, again, this was. A, Jim and I tried in the beginning of the year, stayed in the beginning of the year, that we were going to put more yeah. readings in front of the board. And this is American. one that has been on my counter in my office for a while with like a post it that said potential board reading. So we pulled this one up. Um, again, I went to a guy named Paul Gorsky, Gorsky today who's done doing a lot of equity work in Vermont right now. Um, and that was, that was a very good session today in uh, Rutland. Um, so. It was interesting to see him today and then put it in this perspective. So again, just like last time, we can open up to conversation around this article, what popped to us, what um, we question. I have some thoughts about it. One is that my experience with the kids is that it's really working, that this has been reinforced at least <clears throat> in some... When you say how, it, what do you mean? I don't know how many years. The, just just basically teaching children that, that, that they don't have a fixed potentials or fixed mindsets, that they actually are... That it's that they are in a that everybody fails before they succeed effectively, and we I don't know how many years this has been part of what we, our teachers have been working with our kids on, but I feel like it has been. So from an I don't know how the adults are integrating into their own development, but it is it, they are teaching our children, and so my experience with the children is it's amazingly powerful. So I hope that our educators are also taking that to heart too, or that they're, that they're feeling that same power for their own growth. Um, so. Well, I guess that was gonna be my question was, how well do you think this point of view is being carried out by the faculty? It's interesting you say that. Because mm. one of the things Mr. Gorski said today was um, he was talking about a deficit mindset and that often being a reason for inequitable systems and how that shows itself. Um, so oftentimes um, it shows itself when people say things like, um, when educators with all good intentions behind them, and I'm not knocking them, but with all good intentions will say things like, well, a child can reach um, we can get a kid to reach their own potential. So who's defining that, right? So mm -hmm. right there, you're, you're already in a deficit bucket, yeah. potentially de deficit bucket. Um, or the idea of um, they don't do their homework, so they must be lazy. You know, like, it's, it's like when you give, start giving excuses that blame kids or blame something about the kid's life rather than, this, rather than looking at you know, deeper into the system and structure around it. Like what would you need to get your homework done? Mm -hmm. So every one of our teachers, I, I bet, I, I would bet money that every one of our teachers says, yes, I have a growth mindset and I teach growth mindset to my kids and I have my growth mindset myself. And we also have this mentality, not from all teachers, but we have a deficit mentality from some. Um, and we actually, as a leadership team, I promise I won't commandeer this entire conversation, we did a we did a check like we did a exit ticket one day and we um, and the 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 exit ticket was something along the lines of respond to the statement all kids will learn because of what we do, right? And so 
educators responded in many different ways and the leadership team put their responses on a continuum. So now we have this learning progression of where teachers' belief systems are um, along this mindset with the end, one end being all kids will learn because of what we do. We will not allow any child to fail. We will make the structure and system in place to work with every child to every kid has a right to fail. You know, basically the idea that I can I can't drag the horse. What's the what's that saying about the horse in the trough, the water? You can't right? bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we have this like wide and granted, we are more top heavy. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. where we yeah. want to be. We're more top heavy, but we still have a, we still have some belief that um, I can't if a kid doesn't want to do it, I I can't make them. You know, like that that mentality, which is that deficit mindset. So it's it's an interesting article. Without, but. I, outing anyone? I mean, is you did this with your your whole staff, your yeah. whole team. Yeah. Did you notice any trends in terms of grade levels? Yes. I mean, I almost in don't schools. want you to say it. <laughs> okay, that's what I the thought. end size is too small. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had, we had ton, we analyzed it in multiple ways. We analyzed yeah. it by school. We analyzed it by grade level or content level. I was surprised by the results. Um, for a couple pieces. I mean, yeah. my kids are at the younger end of that spectrum, and, and I got to say, I don't hear it. I don't see that coming out of. I mean, I hear criticism of my children, but it's not based on that, right? It's other things. I can say you tra tell you traditionally, yeah. elementary and primary yeah. teachers will say if they're not at the end of yeah. yes, we they will learn because of what we do. They are at the position of all kids will achieve at their level. I will get them to wherever they will, you know, like wherever that, they're going. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. That's what an elementary teacher will say. Wow. Um, if they're not here, yeah. that's where they are. Yeah. A high school teacher, if they're not here, will say, "Every kid has an opportunity to fail." Right. I can only do so much. Hmm. So is it, there's there's definitely themes there, and that's right. not just with our school district. No, that's no, across, no. Of course that's, not. Yeah. That's like across. That kind schools. of seems to recognize that there's more maturity going on in high school. So some more uh, assigning more. Um, responsibility to the student for their own failure for their own failure. I'm not agreeing with it I'm just saying it would be a, that would be an odd thing to a really odd thing to say about a six-year-old right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's true. I can see the words coming out that's of the true. mouth of a high school teacher yeah so. yeah we, we, we sometimes forget in high school they're older you forget that they're still kids right, no, they're right? right. they totally yes. are yeah but, um, especially some of our kids they're pretty darn articulate <laughs> kids um, so it's interesting. Yeah. Kind of on failure, I mean, like, how do you deal with failure? Because failure is, I mean, it's it's trite, but you learn a lot more from failure oftentimes than success. And... Often if you're a kid, somebody needs to help you. Somebody needs to help you. Do that learning. If you fail, it can be devastating. And well, you begin sometimes, to think you can't do it. But sometimes if you fail, you can be devastating if you don't know how to fail. If you don't know how to like bounce back from the failure and grow Resil from the failure. Resiliency. Right. Yeah. If you're kind of taught that success is the only result and maybe the only result you're used to, mm -hmm. then how do you deal with failure? Well, so that's, that's what this was about. It, with a fixed mindset, if you encounter failure, you think that it's because of your inherent qualities that you've reached, you know, this, you've been told you're smart and if you're not getting it, then maybe you're not really smart. Because you were never told that, uh, oh, it's 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 all right. Sometimes you need to work harder at this, or you might need to ask for help in this area if you're not getting it the first time around, and figuring out avenues to grow. Um, and so, and so that that I really felt like that's that's like what this whole thing is about is how do you approach those but, challenges, and how do our how do our teachers approach those challenges? Yeah, but from my um, very just quick read of this and from like other times I've read her I think, I think there's another flip thing too which, which sometimes it's not sometimes I think with a fixed mindset it's not so much that you can't deal with failure it's that you put a cap on your own on your own limitations that you operate within like a very defined set of expectations and you don't know how to push them because you, you kind of feel that you you don't have the ability to fail and bounce back. That you just, you know, I'm only going to do so well. I'm only going to do so much of this, or I can only, I can only do so well at this. I don't, you know, and you don't have, you know, and it becomes reinforcing where you, 
therefore you just don't push yourself. It's not that you fail. It's just that you don't, you know, you, you hit what you think is a wall and, and you stop before you get to it. Right. Well, getting twos kind of repeatedly over many years can also hit you that way too. Yeah. It's the same, it's a message of not, not overcoming. It's, it's a very yeah. interesting message that happens. So I, I have a question. So how, you know, when I talk uh, with, so my, my wife's really into Carol Dweck and this whole train of thinking, and her, her, fr- her friends who are teachers or administrators are also very, like she's, she is like the go-to person in education right now, it seems, uh, in terms of like, this well, whole, this in terms of mindsets. My, in, ter- yeah. in terms of mindsets. But are there teachers who are like, yeah, this is kind of, so so I'm not exposed to them, but I imagine there are some teachers who are like, yeah, I don't prescribe to this. I'm not, I'm not sold on this. Is, are there, do you encounter that ever? To, no. Yeah. To growth versus fixed mindset? Yeah. No. Okay. I, no teacher will tell you. No. Okay. I haven't encountered that. They will, they, <laughs> like it goes back to what we were saying before. Hey. It's masked in different ways, mm-hmm. right? So I pulled up the proficiency scale that we made, and these are absolute common. Like I, we didn't make these up as a leadership team. We took them right <laughs> off the paper from what, te- <laughs> from what teacher said. Mm-hmm. So on this end of the scale, um, we, we got some, some of the evidence we got. Were all kids learning at high levels is an impossible task. 100% is unrealistic. Outside factors are to blame for students not reaching high levels of learning. Um, so as soon as you start blaming something else in a student's life, other than the structures and systems that we create in schools, then already you're, you're at a fixed mindset in some way, like if you connect it to Dweck's work for students. Um, the next level up was we can get many kids there, but not all. Students have to be ready to learn before we teach them. That's another elementary that's line. That's, yeah. that's a big time yeah, that's elementary big line. <laughs> um, labels are necessary to get students the help they need. Um, the uh, students can, so the next one up was students can learn to their level. There is no one definition of high levels of learning that could match every student. Um, subjective levels of achievement are reached through modifications and accommodations alone. Then the next Wait, one. What was that one? Say it again. Subjective levels of achievement are reached through modifications and accommodations alone. So that means students couldn't reach whatever bar we set. Oh. That's where the subjective comes yeah. in um, without modifications and, and accommodations. Um, there's uh, the next one up was together we can move more students to high levels of learning a system of collective responsibility will work to get more students learning at high levels the system is working for most our students most students and then at the end we had no challenges too big for our team labels are not needed to define students we will do whatever it takes to make high levels of learning happen for all students so like we had the gamut right <laughs> of responses to this exit ticket so that um, comment that says there's no single definition of a high level of learning yeah. is interesting. What, what is your reaction to that? So that was a big debate because that's, that's like, so when you become an educational leader, you, you stand on pedestals, right? That is my pedestal that I stand on. That is the one that I, I want to get us, Montpelier Roxbury, to all students learning at high levels of learning. But we had to talk about what does that mean, right? So it me so in my mind you have to have some sort of draw. So it means that a kid has achieved proficiency in all of the requirements to get to to some sort of call it, some sort of secondary learning and above, right? So they've learned they've gotten to that that point. So it's usually algebra two, you know, they have quality essay writing. Their speaking and listening is good. They know how to find information from a, you know like all of those kind of things, um, but. You know, some teachers write, well, not everybody's going to take AP classes. Well, no. Yeah, you're right. Not everybody is going to take it. Like, that's not a definition of high-level learning for all students. So we, so we had lots of conversation around that. And then we had also conversations around all students. What does that mean? There's a very small percentage of students who have significant needs um, that have a different plan, that have a different plan for them. And the percentage of those students that we should really be, like, that kind of is taken out of the all is about 2% of our population. Like it's five students in our entire school district, right? Um, and so when you start thinking about that piece, that's where all the labeling comes in, right? And, and well, 
the kid's on an IEP, then like, you can't possibly expect them to get to algebra two. It's like, yeah, I can, you know? <laughs> so we really, we really have some work to do around this, this piece. That's why I've spent so much time, we've spent so much time this year talking about culture and, and what is it, what are our practices and, pro and procedures and structures and systems in a school that are helping us get to where they are or hindering us from getting to where we need to be. Libby, would you mind maybe fleshing that out a little bit more? I think when I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, like you've talked about system changes and you're mm -hmm. like, here's an idea that could be implemented within the district to accomplish something. Like how would that implementation come into yeah. action? Yeah, I can tell you what, like, what happened just... We're talking just... about this continuum right now, like how do we get everybody yeah. to one side or the other? Like, oh, we're working on that, yeah. So um, I can tell you one piece of evidence that is already starting to shift. Um, that happened just last week at in-service at UES. Um, so UES has, had, has a lot of curriculum work to do. That's not a secret to anybody. We've all talked about the level of curriculum work that needs to be done there. And they've gotten a lot done in math this, this year. So they're, they're almost to a spot that's relatively good <laughs> in, in math curriculum. And I'd add Roxbury onto that. Um, but this is just a UES example. And at the staff meeting, they have, to have their priority standard. And what Ryan had them do was say, OK, so here are your prioritized standards. When we say it's a prioritized standard, what we're saying is we are guaranteeing all kids will reach proficiency in these standards. OK? And the list per grade level is six to eight standards. Like, so we've thrown some standards out. It's nice to know. Like, or they're learning targets within a bigger standard. But we're certainly not taking the entire third grade common core in math and saying we're going to guarantee this entire document because that would take probably three years of schooling in order to get all kids math. It's just not possible, right? So they picked the prioritized standards for each grade level in math. And then Ryan said, okay, so if you were going to pace this out throughout a year, like, how long would it take? Like, here are your six prioritized standards in math. Like, pace that out. How long is it going to take to teach kids, you know, place value in second grade for your standard, right? Um, and so all, all the grade levels did that, and they all did it on separate chart paper, and then they put it all up together. Okay, and one particular grade level, and I'm not going to single them out because that would be mean, um, one particular grade level looked at their chart and looked significantly different than the other, other charts because there were things like, well, we don't start any new learning for the first month and a half of school. Or we have multiple things coming into, multiple like outside art projects coming into our grade level. So like, we're not really sure. We'll give place value two weeks, but mm, like it was really different than the other grade levels. But they put it up, and without anybody saying any word, the, the grade level said, hold on, took their chart down, and then went and had another discussion around, oh, maybe we can't take a month and a half of no, like, wait, hold on, you don't do that? And they started talking to their other colleagues. And so right there, there's a shift in thinking already happening that, like, oh, yeah, we're required by law to ensure this, these standards. And so that, that's a big shift. That's a huge shift. Um, for UES, that curriculum work is the beginning. So we need to make sure that we have a K-12 articulated prioritized standards and everything else bumps off of that. So that was just the principal and the teachers. Yes. So Mike Berry was not involved in... He wasn't involved. He was involved in creating the curriculum document. He wasn't involved in that particular in-service. Okay. Yeah, but he's been very integral in doing the curriculum work itself. So yep. she used that as an example of a, a culture shift or a, uh, more of an adoption, a cultural adoption of the principles you're trying to get across. I mean, I'm trying to understand. Yep. I think your question was, what are the tools you're using? To, I got that right. actually, to, make the, to, to make things. the transition. Yeah. Yeah. So I can talk about this ad nauseum for a long time. Sure. So shut me yeah. up or mm -hmm. when I'm starting to get too technical. <laughs> so when you have these prioritized standards, right, and we can say, these are the ones we're guaranteeing, mm -hmm. right? So now our shift of how we do tier two and tier three intervention, right? So that learning isn't the, isn't the variable, but time is the variable. Right now, time is the constant. Like, I have two weeks to teach this or whatever. And learning is the variable. They may or may not get it in that two weeks, right? Um, so we want to flip that, right? And we want to have systems and structures in place to do it. Right now, currently, the way it is, it's um, Jim's a pretty loud teacher. He's got some kids with some reading struggles. So he goes to the interventionist and says, hey, take my kids for, you know, and the interventionist says, sure, I'll take them for three times a week for 30 minutes a day, and we'll do this program. Well, we've been doing that for years. How is it working for us? 
right? It's, it's not, it's not changing what's happening. So now what we say is if I'm the interventionist and Jim comes to me and he's, he can say, show me your formative assessments around the prioritized standard, because that's how I'm using the limited resource, the limited human resource we have in intervention right now to target that, because we're guaranteeing that, right? And so that kid might need more time, they might need more specialized skill instruction, they might need to break it down differently. Um, and so we get our interventionists really skilled at teaching our priorities and our universal skills. And then, um, and that provides more opportunities for kids, right? So we start guarantee, we can actually guarantee things happening. That's just an example, right? PLC time, professional learning time, or professional learning communities that our teachers are currently in, in all four of our buildings, we have these. Um, they are not, they're now gonna be focused on, here's our prioritized standard. What's our common formative assessment? How are we looking at our data? What's our instructional cycle look like? Hey, Bridget, what activity worked for you? Because you got, you knocked, your kids knocked it out of the park. Like, my kids didn't. So what did you do? Like, let me come watch you. Or, or even, let's swap kids. Because I can do some enrichment with these kids. But you did really well with that. So why don't you take these kids for the second time around? So now we can start to have those conversations. Before, without a curriculum with the prioritized standards, teachers were teaching, like, you, you'd walk into four different fourth grade classrooms and you'd see four different math units going on at one time. So, so the question becomes, what's tight and what's loose? What's tight is you're teaching to the curriculum that we've all agreed upon, right? That's tight. You're giving performative assessments based on the prioritized standards. How you teach it, I, that's so loose for me because I want Ryan to teach it different than Tina so that they can have a conversation about what really works. You know, like what's ex that's where like professional growth happens with teachers when they can start talking about that. Um, but the time frame in which they're teaching it, the, what they're teaching in terms of content, um, it, that's the tight piece. So all of these things start to stem off of each other. Uh, and that's when we start to narrow that gap of learning. So one of the sentences I liked was, those who had a growth mindset said that they knew that the student could do better, encouraged the student to try harder, and gave the student specific suggestions for studying and learning strategies. So I didn't get it. If you are my teacher and you just say it again, probably I'm not going to get it again. So that issue of what, what do I need to do to learn better, Somebody's, kids are learning how to learn. So somebody needs to give you a clue along the way about how do I study for this if I don't know how, or how do I read this so that I can get out of it what I, know, what I need to know. And that's, that's a biggie too, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just pulling up one other doc that we're kind of working with. This is like total draft. I gotta remember where I put it. As when your kid comes home with a two and your kid comes home with a three, we actually have a proficiency scale that's gonna be tied to it. So you know what that means, right? The kid knows what that means, and it means the same for you two, right? No matter what classroom you're in. Right. And whether you're a behaved student or a not behaved student. That's the best. <laughs> um, so all of these things are intricately tied together. Um, and once we have this piece in place, like I, because we do. We, I already know we do, but, but we, don't, we don't have the system in place yet, right? And I've talked about that before. I'm not going to add people to a system that's broken. So now we can start transforming our system a bit more, and then we can really see where our holes are for that piece. Can you, can you expound upon that behaved or not behaved piece? With, with yeah, if you're, if you're a nudge, mm -hmm. chances are you're going to get lower scores than Steve is, who's a great it's, kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so hard as a teacher because you, you kind of also connect it to not learning when you know like you let's say you're chronically getting your stuff in late right or missing it occasionally and you get you see in the proficiency scores you get docked and kid knows everything they're supposed to know but they just don't play by the rules yeah well and that's kind of why I went back to the the failing thing because I think it's because there's a lot of actually very high achieving people who have very fixed mindsets oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah and <laughs> and it actually kind of goes to you know, kind of, you know, the male, female in the workplace thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of men tend to, even though they sometimes they come with lower grades and worse academics, they get into certain work environments and, you know, they feel they can do jobs that maybe they can't do and therefore they get into them. And it's, it, you know, there's been some studies that that kind of plays into some of the imbalance in the workplace. 
Um, so like a, f a fixed mindset and not doing well or failing are not always synonymous. I mean, it sometimes comes into those later places where you get someone who appears to be very high achieving and then gets into a challenge situation and that's where the fixed mindset gets in the way. Oftentimes that's the challenge with proficiency-based grading too. Yeah. That a kid who's always yes. played the game of school really well and gotten A's has twos, yeah. right? Because they're not mm -hmm. at proficiency yet. Um, so yeah. this is this is the doc. I, this is like total draft, so I don't have it to give out <laughs> yet. Um, but this, these are like the stages. So what we're working on right now is what are our focus stages for uh, an effective MTSS model. So the first one is formalized essential learning that gets into the standard work that I just talked about, right? And so what we're doing is we're um, like our goals or what are the bulleted things that need to happen along that? You know we can't see that. No, I know. <laughs> I'm just should, like pointing here. And then, sure about that, Steve. <laughs> and then the, the next thing is specialized learning for the faculty. What's the learning it's the faculty bit, need yeah. to do in order to understand this formalized essential learning, right? Because that's on us. We have to give them the, we have to build their capacity to do that. So we need to provide that for them, we being the leadership team. And then what are the potential needs of our system? in order to make that happen. And then for each of these pieces of our focus stages, we're gonna have our own proficiency scale attached to it. So we're building this right now. So when I keep saying to you, we're gonna bring something to you, we're building this right now. The second one is collaborative practices and collective responsibilities. That's where all the PLC work comes in. That's where the data management system comes in, all of that piece. Um, time. Could you, could you like do an example like horizontally? Sure, I collaborative mean, practices or collective responsibility. So um, one of the things that we is in here is um, um, instructional cycles occurring around our priority standards. So the priority standards that are there, right? Um, and so if we move over to specialized learning for the faculty, it's um, they may need some work. These are just like predictions. They may need some work on collaborative goal setting based on data analysis. Right, so they may not need to look at a whole bunch of data that their kids are getting from formative assessments and say, what is it that we can do to make really small, tangible goals for kids to take the next step? Um, and then uh, a potential need is that data management system so that they can pull up data really quickly and don't have to fumble through papers to do it, right? And that I can do sorts at the district level and Mike can do sorts and principals can do sorts really quickly. So that's just an example of like going across, mm -hmm. right? Um, the next one is timely system to remediate, intervene, and enrich. Right there, we need faculty learning on what those three things are, right? So remediate is the tier three. They've got lots of gaps in learning, and they're the universal skills, whereas intervene is they're, they need more time with that priority standard, and those things are very different. And then to en like we can't forget kids who need enrichment as well, right, around um, the priority standards. So... So in there, it's um, we need clearly defined roles and tiered intervention. Um, and with that, we need to increase our instructional capacity of our interventionists big time. Um, and another, and then potential needs might be increase our human resources and core content intervention. So it's kind of working its way across in that way. Does that make sense? And then the last one here is high quality first instruction. So in that is we need an articulated instructional framework that we can say, welcome to Montpelier Roxbury. This is what we believe is high quality instruction and this is how we're gonna train you to get there. Um, and then we have the indicators. With that is the connection to the supervision and evaluation system. And then, um, and we're, we're gonna need a lot of intentional professional learning around that piece. So this is what we're building out. And what this is not a one year thing. This is a five, six year thing. <laughs> Um, and schools need to come in where they are, right? Yeah. So again, it goes to tight loose. This isn't a choice, that's the tight part, but you know, Pam at, at Main Street might say, we really need to dig into this collaborative practice piece. So that's gonna be our focus at Main Street. I'm, I don't know if that's what she would choose, but, <laughs> but that's like, let's just say she does that. So then at the district level, we can say, okay, what are we gonna do with our professional resources to ensure that we build the capacity at Main Street, that they have the resources, the funding, the time, and all that kind of thing to make that happen because it fits within our overall goals. Um, and, and we kind of control the money pot, right? <laughs> so we have, so that's all tighter and, and more defined. So I have thought in the past that the Montpelier pa faculty, as good as they are, and I believe they're very good, mm -hmm. have not had 
uh, quite so specific a curriculum. So how are they doing with that? <laughs> They're good at developing. Oh, they haven't been pushed to do yet. Okay. So <laughs> um, I'm talking from the elementary middle school level. Mm -hmm. Um, they're very good at developing and talking. We have, we're starting to formalize on paper. Um, however, they have not actually put it into practice, like put a tight curriculum into in practice, practice yet. They have curricular stuff that they're doing, of course, oh, but it's, it's right. just very different regardless or depending on which classroom you go into. So with all the essential work you're doing around the curriculum, you know, getting your curriculum down for, let's say, math, mm -hmm. Do you, is there ever time to go work on the curriculum for art or for yeah they're doing that work too they are yeah or the curriculum for you know for like you know social studies which is so hard sometimes yeah social studies they haven't we haven't touched yet so because hard. the state adopted a year and a half ago yeah. two years ago c3 which is a new standards okay. document and it's like the worst written mm -hmm. i mean i don't think the standards are bad in it but it's like a very hard that's going to be the last work we do quite honestly Art, PE, music, all of the, whenever Mike is in front of the whole staff doing an in-service, they're working on their curriculum as well. Um, and we're working on how do we get it vertically, vertically articulated yeah. across, that's much harder than you think, and that's not mm. unique to us. <laughs> that's hard in every district to get art teachers all sitting down and talking um, across mm. K-12. Um, well, I mean, vertical and social studies is, is brutal. Yeah, so, yeah, social studies is one of the hardest yeah. curriculum areas to do this work in. It, it hands down, hands down, because you get into debates as, of things like, as an American, what do you have to know, mm -hmm. right? And it gets to yeah. content versus case study. It's hard, social studies yeah. is hard. That's well, why their document is so bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is, because they couldn't make those decisions. So they're right. like, we'll just let the schools make those decisions. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's we know, to go back to Steve's point about the arts, um, there's some discussion in here about, you know, how the brain, the brain growing, you know, the scientific basis for the growth mindset, the mm -hmm. brain growing new, new connections. And I was thinking about how so much of that research involved music. Mm -hmm. Yet, in some ways, music is one of those areas where there's so often that reaction of, you're talented. I'll say, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're not. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, Absolutely. right? Foreign language, too. Huh? And foreign, yeah. foreign language. language. Um, yeah, very early on, yeah. they're labeled whether you can do it or not. And I was I'm told. Really I was told by on. the third grade music mm -hmm. teacher that I had no musical talent and should stop taking. <laughs> 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 and okay. then I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah. And that's that's a good point though, because when we talk about growth and fixed mindset, every one of us, like I'll say, I, I have a pretty growth mindset, right? I make a whole <laughs> lot of mistakes, and I admit to it, and then I learn from it, right? But I am so fixed in certain areas. Art for me. I, I don't even know if a teacher ever said, like, I don't want to be better in art, <laughs> you know? Like, I have a very fixed mindset. I'm fine with my stick figures. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, so so we all have areas where they're growth and fixed, right? And well, it's not your a, husband and, and, and love that. Yeah. <laughs> and like, <laughs> that helps our relationship. <laughs> There's no competition. Right. <laughs> yeah, and to be and let's be honest, I mean, to some extent, the growth mindset thing is, is a bit of a fiction that's a, a helpful tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you just, yeah, there are, I see it with running all the time. I mean, there are just people who, without training much at all, can go out and you know trot effortlessly at a six-minute pace. Mm -hmm. And they're huh? I think that's a little bit different, though. That you're talking well, about I, I, but versus, versus, but I think even yeah yeah. I mean, I mean not everyone is going to be an Einstein, as was pointed out in here. Oh, you're going on the you're going on the, on the low end of a the, deficit the, model. Yeah. 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 But. I, you know, sure. I mean, people are gonna, you you know, people are gonna this. excel in different areas and have different yeah, but the interests. You talked about those guys excelling just before with the fixed mindset is an example of them. Well, uh, they have the growth growth mindset. Right? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the example you gave of people with the fixed mindset guys excelling who didn't do well in school excelling. They're they're beneficiaries of societal power structures and gender dynamics that have advantaged men over women. Oh, I, to I totally and agree so with that. that yeah. you know, I totally agree with that. That's not like, uh, I, don't, I don't view that as a very good example of how, you know, a fixed mindset can help you excel. That's, those are other societal but, elements that help them excel. No, there are definitely other excel, but um, there are definitely some gender studies that, you know, and I think this is part of, of kind of how we, and I think it plays into those societal things where, like oftentimes women are more likely to say things you know, if they don't do all the tests that it's because they weren't smart enough, whereas men will say, they didn't, yeah, they didn't try hard. 
So the men are the ones with the fixed, the growth mindset, you're, you're saying, generally. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm saying that, that fixed mindset, that learning how to fail, kind of going back to learning how to fail, is important to a growth mindset, that getting past that point, that you can, you can be high achieving in an academic setting and have a fixed mindset. And you can be low or, or medium achieving and have a growth mindset or at least not have the impediments and I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's societal messages we send to, to men and women that, you know, I think it probably goes to some, some bigger issues about, you know, how our education system is set up and some, some gender basis there too, because right now women are performing much better in school and they're going to college at much higher rates. And that's not yet reflected in the workplace power structure. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a podcast today in the car driving back from Rutland, and, and the person on the podcast said something like, success and failure are, are the same coin. Like, it's not, those two things go hand in hand with learning, which is really interesting. And I always think about this thing, these kind of ideas of how are we, how are we going about our own learning? I don't care if you're a kid or a teacher, right? So my kid really, my oldest really struggles in math and had the I hate math, I can't do it kind of thing. So we sat him down, wouldn't you love to be my kid? We <laughs> sat him down with YouTube videos showing him how synapses form across multiple tries. And you know, like he, much less, he could talk to you about brain synapses because that's where we went with him. Um, but it changed his mentality about math. You know, like, okay, I get this. Like, things are far apart in my brain right now and they need to come closer together. And I think it's, I think that's really helpful for kids to know, especially, it, well, I'm not even going to say that. Kids who are really good at playing school need to know that because oftentimes the things that they're rewarded for their synapses being really close to might not be the things they need to be talked to, you know. And then you got Jakey who's struggling with math and, you know, that really helped him persevere through some some challenging math content. There's a beautiful TED talk that you probably know that um, a, so a educational professional talking about using skateboarding as the as the explanation of this and he's showing skateboarders in a park over and over missing and over the again. trick, yeah. missing the trick, missing the trick, falling on their butts. And he's like, now how we do this in education is we give them an F every single time they yeah. they fall on their butt. Yeah. And he goes, and then one day they nail it. And then we give him an A. And he goes, that is, that is what is wrong with that picture, right? And that's how we reward children in a sense. And you know, you fail, you fail, you fail. But if you think of it like a skateboarder, it just clicks. And you just have to keep trying. And I can't remember what it was, but it's just a beautiful thing. And uh, the, yeah. the skateboard culture doesn't have that sense of I can't do that trick, right? Right. right. I, want, I just want to say one thing about, uh, to give props to the teachers in this district. I have a daughter who struggles a lot literacy, and it's not in her vocabulary that she can't do it, and it's not, and the, it's just not part of. Even though it's 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 hard, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's discouraging. It's just she does not say I can't do this ever. It's great, and that means that she's never been getting that message. Right. 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 So it's you know I think that it'll she will overcome, and the fact that you said that time is the variable is really important. Yes. Um, and when we think about the con continuity of the curriculum through the grades, you know, how important that's going to be as you keep your two up to the end, right? And then you move into the next grade and you still got that, you started yeah. at the deficit, right? So anyway, just, I mean, I think that there's a lot of great stuff going on. Yeah. You know, yeah. Even, if, even if it's not fully permeated, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, we, and I agree with you, Steve. There's, it was during, I wish Michelle were here because she heard this. Um, during the principal interview with our two students who were on the interview committee, they, without talking to each other or anything, one of the candidates said, what's great about your school? And both of them talked about the exact same teacher mm -hmm. in a different context about how this teacher sat with them during that summative week, you know, where kids, kids there's a typical school, and, and, and one guy said, I sat with that teacher every single day, and she got me through it. Like, she, she sat there with me for six hours a day, for five straight days. And then the other student said this, yeah, that same teacher, I would have never taken this AP class, but she said I could do it. And so I tried it and I love it. And I'm thinking about going to school for it now. You know, like it was just, like those kind of things are what gives you goof yeah. goosebumps, you know? Yeah. To, to touch yeah. upon what these these three were, were saying, um, I feel like 
welcoming failure and teaching our students to welcome failure and learn from failure and put yourself out there and be okay with failing and understand that failing is part of making ourselves better and realizing a better version of ourselves is um, something something that I think I think we talk about regularly fostering and even you know helping students foster their interests and passions it's really important but you know really kind of looking at it head on as you know failure is an important part of the learning process and I think it comes in with music and um, in foreign language especially, because you really put yourself out there. Other people are hearing you. And so if you put yourself out there and you fail, you pronounce something incorrectly, you hit a wrong note, whatever, it's really apparent. But it's those opportunities that allow us to learn and allow us to grow and allow us to pronounce those words and string together those sentences in other languages and play those songs and hit those notes. And how are we modeling it as adults? How often do we admit to our shortcomings <laughs> and mistakes. Myself on a regular basis right or now. Even but get out of your, <laughs> you can get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Like, you know, the kids are like, let's, yeah, yeah. let's yeah. dance or try the hulu. I'm like, I ain't trying the hulu. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, that's the wrong message. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, good conversation. Yeah. Although singing sometimes it might be okay to have a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I grabbed that one. Sounds like my son. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get you re-educated. I, I, I could probably do the re-educating if you sat in the room with me for half an hour. <laughs> All right, you want to move on to policy? Yes. Um, do you want to? Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so I brought this to Jim's attention. This came from my um, principals, particularly Pam and Mike um, in the upper grades. Um, so we have, a, we have a high population of students who are identifying as transgender. Um, and one of the things they're coming to, and this actually is happening a little bit at the elementary school as well. Um, they're coming to the administration asking for school, school to um, call them by different names. Which is absolutely, and our school, our social workers have been working on a policy to ensure that that's, or a procedure to ensure that that's okay. Um, and and our school staff has jumped to the, I mean, they, they do it regularly. Um, and so, but one of the challenges that we were talking about in our leadership team was if, um, is the parent, so where, where does it go for official um, school business, like mm -hmm. progress reports, report cards, that kind of thing. Um, so, and if the, if both if parents and are divorced or they're not living together or they're, they're just not around and progress reports go to both entities and not, and one parent doesn't know. Um, and so there, so then, you know, it's an opportunity for a conversation and that kind of thing. Um, but when I was talking to Jim about it, I think we're doing the right thing right now with this and following student wishes and, and, and that kind of idea. However, I could foresee and the principals could foresee if um, we would like to request the board to write a policy around this. And there's a voluntary policy, policy on the VSBA website. And we'd like to request the board to dig into that and to perhaps have a policy because we have the right procedure in place, but we don't have the board backing from it um, right now. So, so we feel like it would put us in a stronger position for supporting all students and, and, yeah. and what they're doing if we had a board policy around um, this particular issue. And so this is an issue that strikes me as one that doesn't, isn't necessarily um, specific to transgender students, is that correct? Even though that might be where you're seeing the issues right now. Because if you have a student name, you know, um, if, if you have a student who's not transgender, let's just take an example of a student named Samantha who wants to go by the name Terry. Wouldn't that be a similar situation? Good. We're not experiencing that right now. I know we're not experiencing <laughs> that, but I'm wondering if the policy should... Could be broader. I, yeah. I think that's something for the board to discuss. I, I would say I that's something the board to discuss. It's We're experiencing it with students who are, um, are, are working through their gender identity mm -hmm. and, and that piece. That's what we're yeah. experiencing. We're, we're going that. through this at, we're in my work and taking care of um, transgender people in the community and in our own employment too. And they're very, it's a very different, how, it's actually even different from your policies on LGBT 
your broader policies, you know, working with a transgender person is actually separate from recognizing and respecting other well, people as well. there's definitely a more public identity mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Wait, mm -hmm. can you go into that a little bit more? Well, the health care needs are different yeah. from people yeah. going. So, so in my work, that's what we're focused on, the health care needs. But we have employees undergoing transition, too, and who would wish to go by um, a different pronoun. And um, we have other employees who struggle with that. So we're working on it real hard internally. I don't know if that. A policy would also state it so theoretically everybody would know it if they read the policy. So if we say we're going to honor a child who says, I want to be called X, and in honoring that, we send all official documents by that name. It's, it's up front. So if you as a parent didn't know, well, we have the policy that said it's not our responsibility to tell you it. We've said we're going to send them in this way. You know what I mean? It's written down. Now there's nothing written down. There. It also helps us protect the kiddo, too, who mm -hmm. may not recognize in that moment of all the different legal pieces right. that are connected to that as well. So it, I think it... Yeah. And I did take a look today at the VSBA model policy on this issue, okay. and it really did focus almost entirely on <coughs> this name piece. Mm -hmm. um, the Title IX laws, um, how things can be proactively and reactively changed with names, who has the authority, the child, the parent, etc. cetera. Um, it's like it, the... Yeah, who does have, who does have the authority? Mm -hmm. Well, Libby is right, the, and again, I'm not the, the lawyer, the expert on the front, but from what I read and from what I understand, the district should honor whatever the student chooses to be called by. And then, let's see, I think it does, it's up to the parents still to go back to the legal documents, I think. Look, I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but. I don't at this point. I mean, um, this yeah. is new for us. This, well, it's right. legally, there's a process for changing it. Yeah. 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 Yes. Right. Yeah. And so that policy would apply to any age child? Yes. And to the, the, the child's wishes will. I think that's what this board would want to discuss once everybody has something in front of them, yeah? And what if you have a situation where there is a tension between the desires of the child and the desires of the parents or mm -hmm. a parent? It's going to have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Part of the policy. I said if you have a tension. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to have to be addressed yeah. directly. I'm, yeah. in, in my work situation, we're not haven't yet had a child that we had to take care of with this. It's always been an adult making the decision, mm -hmm. but I can imagine it's even more than name, even so much as Sam could be a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. It's about the pronoun, in my experience, it's about the pronouns that people use. He or she is very important to the person undergoing transition, and, and getting that right mm -hmm. is really important as well. It's surprisingly hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A challenge. It seems like this probably goes very smoothly until you have um, a question of trust between parents or trust between children and parents in terms of privacy. Yeah. I think, and then all of a sudden everything falls apart in terms of how you communicate. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you just get a tacit agreement, I assume. Okay, what are we going to do here? Okay, let's all use that term. And then it starts to fall apart when people are nervous about their own safety or privacy, I imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Thus far, our amazing principals and social workers have helped families have the conversation, um, which is what we want them to do. Yeah, of course. Um, so thus far, it's worked out. It's been ner a little anxiety producing in the beginning, but um, mm. the conversations are generally supported by our amazing staff. It's as it is possible, a child would feel more comfortable having this discussion at school than they oh, would yeah. at home, mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. they know what the reaction is going to be. So yep. they have it at school, and then the next. Um, yeah, sometime they have to have it at home. So, they're minors, so at some yeah. point it does have to go home. Yeah. Is there anything else besides the name, as far as that, that the policy, that would be good to address in the policy? I would want um, Pam and Mike here, and maybe mm -hmm. the social workers, to, mm -hmm. to engage in that question with you, because mm -hmm. um, they are closer to the front than I am. So yeah. I would want them to or I would want to have a, a good in-depth conversation with them before I talked about it. And do we have, um, <clears throat> and we already have 
gender neutral bathrooms or neutral locker rooms, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, because well, this was on the agenda, it did come up, and I asked Mike, so I would.